that's all our introductions, except that I would like to introduce you to our three panelists today. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of their bio information to begin, and then we'll kick it all off with a good first question. Um, so first of all, we welcome Monique Converse. Um, Monique is the artistic director and founder of Het Filial Theatre Makers, and characteristic of her directing style is the infectious love for the merging of music and theatre of musicians and actors. The inspiring collaboration with Hungarian Canadian composer Gabor Tarzan, you're going to tell me I said that wrong later on, but I'm so sorry, uh, bears witness to this. Their joint productions excel in craftsmanship, humor, musicality, and the use of powerful, almost cinematic images on stage. The last couple of years, object theater and the use of live video have become more and more a part of their signature style. Hexilia Theater Makers is based in the Netherlands. And Monique's shows have toured the world from Sydney to Shanghai, from New York to Moscow. So welcome, Monique. We're really delighted that you're joining us today. Um, and we're also going to welcome Enrique Kula. Uh, Enrique is the CEO of Theatre Centre or Theatre Centrum. Enrique, can you correct my pronunciation or is that about right? <laughs> Thank you. Which is a competence center for the dissemination of theater for children and adolescents and the organizer of the Danish April Festival for Theater for Young Audiences. Henrik has served as the chair for the Danish Children's Theater Organization and for Scenic, an organization promoting sales, visibility, access to, and documentation of performing arts. He has also served on the advisory board for the Danish National School of Performing Arts. So welcome, Enrique. It's a delight to have you today. And our third panelist is the one and only Nikki Sved of Theatre Alibi. So Nikki is Theatre Alibi's artistic director. She is the chair of Exeter Culture and is on the steering group for Exeter UNESCO City of Literature, which is a very exciting thing about to happen. Nikki is also directed for Theatre Cluid Outreach and Platform 4 and has taught at Exeter University Drama Department. I cannot list the shows she's directed for Theatre Alibi because there's too many of them and it would take the rest of the 90 minutes. Um, but it's a delight to have you here in the very first one of these Thursday lunchtime today. Thank you so much. Would you all like to unmute and just say hello and we will kick off with the first question. Yeah, hello to everybody. Yes, hello all. And hello. Uh, so, so we were just having a bit of a chat before this began um, and I floated an idea for a first question to these three and I think I am going to kick off with it but I think we'll talk about it uh, from the personal not from the cultural. So, so the question is about um, some of the differences we sometimes feel when we're talking about theatre for young audiences internationally. Um, so I know that Nikki and I experience a certain reality here in the UK around theatre for young audiences and the way that it's sometimes perceived or perhaps valued. And that could be by policymakers, by local authority, by the rest of the industry, the theatre industry. It could be by the way that it's valued by schools. Um, and so I'm curious about differences we feel about that. So Enrique, in terms of your, your understanding or your background, especially with the way the April Festival functions, which sounds like just a really amazing initiative in terms of the value, value of theatre for young audiences. And Monique, in terms of your work, I'm curious about uh, perhaps a perception that sometimes the grass might be a bit greener elsewhere about how theatre for young audiences is perceived. And maybe that the reality isn't that, or perhaps that it is. Would anyone like to speak to that a little bit as a start off question? Is the grass greener in Denmark? Is the grass greener <laughs> in the <laughs> Netherlands with regards to the value of theatre for young audiences? I think it, it could be, uh, I, I could tell a little about how we're doing it in Denmark because it, it has something to do with that question because we are, I don't know whether the grass is greener, but it's, uh, at least it's higher than it is because we're reaching a lot more children in, in Denmark than you are actually that you are in most of the European countries or countries around the world. And, and it basically, it's, it's because of the system that we have. I, I mean, just to think that we have an organization like mine, uh, which Theater Centrum, which is an, uh, is an official part of the Ministry of Culture that are made to uh, disseminate theatre for young audiences is showing that we are actually taking the the idea of children meeting art very seriously here in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And we are doing that in many different ways, politically and also practically in the schools. And 
we are I mean, first of all, we have a system that we call the reimbursement system. It's a system that means that every time a municipality, a school, a kindergarten, a cultural institution around the country buys something, uh, a show or something concerning uh, theatre for young audiences, they, they get a 50% reimbursement from the government. Uh, so, so in that sense, it helps. I mean, I mean economy always helps people uh to to act and actually we are a small country we are only uh, six million people in denmark uh, which means that we are approximately 1.23 million uh, citizens under the age of 18 and actually every year we are reaching uh, around half of them in our system so approximately seven eight hundred children in denmark have, have sees a, a show every year uh, in their school. Mm -hmm. uh, basically because of that reimbursement system, of course, but also because we have a close connection to the schools, the way that we cooperate and work with the municipalities about creating systems that ensures that uh, the theater actually uh, reach out to the schools is, is working quite well. In different ways, we are 98 municipalities in Denmark and there are 98 uh, different systems but uh, each of them in their individual way actually works to reach the children so in that sense the spread of theater in Denmark is quite uh, is quite good could be better though I and mean, we're always talking about that it's part of our strategy that we want to ensure that children meet theater uh, every year Every single child, uh, regardless of, of economy, geographical situation, or social or, or ethnical situation, but but still, we are actually reaching out in a lot of places with this system, mm -hmm. and it also means that we have a lot of companies to fulfill this goal. I mean, in a small country like ours, we still have a, a, approximately 150. Uh, uh, companies producing exclusively for children and all of them are touring into the schools and they are touring with their own equipment they bring everything so it's very easy for them to go into the school and and perform in the school and that's a part of, of the system and in that system we have uh, April festival as a very necessary and and uh, and uh, uh, welcoming part because it's a showcase for the companies towards the schools uh, besides being a, a touring festival we tour to a new municipality every year so so uh, uh, we meet a new audience every way every year but we also invite uh, uh, buyers and, and teachers and librarians and everybody to the festival to come and see shows to know what they want to to uh, buy for the next year because we urge them to see what they buy before they buy it so in that sense we we have this surplus of uh, activity where uh, april festivals actually in the center of that april festivals festival is one week with approximately 800 shows in one municipality so actually there's a lot of activity going on that you can participate in as a both as an a citizen in in uh, in the area or the region, but also as a professional. So, and that's an, all. This is connected to this uh, this cyclist system that ensures that children meets art uh, in, on a regular basis. So, in that sense, you can say we have partly green grass in Denmark. I'll say partly green grass. I like that as an idea. <laughs> I think it's a good relative eh, from your own perspective and, and uh, um, I don't know the color of your grass in a way and, um, um, and other than Henrik I, I, I'm, I'm not on the, in a function that I have this view of the whole total of the Netherlands mm. um, uh, but we're di very differently organized here than in Denmark and I think a big difference is that um, the children's theater companies and also my company uh, they don't work exclusively in the schools. There are a few com companies, professional companies, dedicated to schools, but a lot of the companies, like my company, um, have the focus more to work, um, to make a theater show with everything on it and in it and have all the technical stuff. And, um, and also I have, I have this um, uh, sentence that I always say, 
that I, I want uh, uh, Kevin and Mustafa and Kelly and Fatima uh, when they cross the street and, they, and they're in town and they, and they see a theater building that they know that that's a building that they're welcome and that exciting stuff happens there. Yeah. So um, going to a theater with, with, with school I think is crucial that you can do that. And our system is also more built around that, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, um, there are, we as a company make theater for uh, the kindergarten age. So for the four, five, six year olds, we do that, we bring that into the schools. And actually at the moment we are doing a, 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 I say that kind of a um, residency in a school. So we're there for a week and their, their small kids join the rehearsal and things like that. So that works well. And even now in this time, we're welcome in a school to do that. Mm -hmm. so they just don't mix the kids. We just have one class, you know? And, um, but for the rest of the shows, we still, we're dependent on the theaters to book us and for the schools to come there. So that's a whole different system. And the good thing now, I think, and there's where the grass is really greener, is that our government, uh, both our national government and our local government, um, are becoming much more aware that actors are <laughs> just as expensive in a theater show for a young audience as for an adult audience. Mm. And there's something with the funding that was really, really, really uh, off balance in a way for, for children's theater companies. Well, yeah, we come from this kind of paternalistic thinking that everything that has to do with smaller bodies has, can be done for a smaller budget. I don't know. It's kind of a weird kind of type of thinking. But um, more and more there's this awareness growing and um, um, you see it now also with the COVID-19 with the, the uh, uh, I say that um, extra subsidies that our government has now that um, children, children theater companies or theater for young audience are just as well treated as the companies for adults. That's just a level playing field if it has to do now with COVID-19 new measures or new whatever. And I think that's probably a difference too. Mm, it's really, really interesting. Nikki, I don't know, do you want to say anything about how green your grass feels for you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I also feel that I can talk more particularly from our own perspective, you know, in that I'm not a, a festival director. Um, and so there may well be a sort of myriad of views about um, the, the, the British situation for children's theatre. Um, we've, got, we've got a long history of going into primary schools in terms of um, performing work, not because we're educationally driven, but because there is a real sense of wanting to reach every mm -hmm. child in a community. So that same work that goes into primary schools would also go into theatres, you know, it might be um, at Oxford Playhouse one week and in a small Devon Primary School the next. Um, and so uh, I have a real clear sense of um, the way in which schools receive work. And I'd say, looking around the country, we're, we're reaching around 13,000 children every year in Devon, but that is rare. It's difficult to get into primary schools in this country, and that'll be for a, 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 a variety of reasons, um, partly to do with the curriculum being quite narrow and the sort of culture, it, it's hard. You have to work in real close partnership with schools um, to get in and schools are predominantly funding those visits via um, parents, um, you know, or, or um, yeah, it predominantly is what's called a voluntary contribution. Um, so they're having to find the means, they're not subsidized basically to bring in arts very often. Um, so that that is, that's definitely a, a stumbling block and it affects the quality of work that gets into schools. I'd say more broadly, I mean, there is a lot of really exceptional work. Some of the most radical and interesting work in the country is happening um, in children's theatre. Uh, and I think, I feel like I've been saying for decades, oh, I think it's getting better. I think it's getting better. But actually, why am I still saying that? Why am I still saying that? So that there is, there is a sense, I think, that, that some of that work is more being recognized. I'm gonna hang on in there. But, but still, you know, from an industry perspective, I know, I know when I'm trying to employ a performer that there will be a sense that they're doing something lesser working in children's theater. I know that when we're talking to venues, it is really hard for them. You know, unlike what Monique is saying, it's really hard for them to book at any time that isn't a holiday or a half term. 
So actually, um, it's really difficult for schools to, to justify a theatre visit when it's not a Christmas pantomime. So there are, there are difficulties on one hand and on the other, I find some of the quality of the work really inspiring. And I've also found um, that there is an undoubted support from, from the Arts Council in England for children's work. There's perhaps um, more of an emphasis on understanding how participatory work can have effect rather than performance. You know, you get real solid outcomes when you see a child who's, who's, who's participated in a piece and it's a little bit um, less easy to put your finger on when it's a performance that children are, are responding to. And yet it seems to me that the two things should really intimately go hand in hand. Um, and I've also found it really heartening watching how schools have responded um, during the current situation. So we are taking um, a piece into primary schools now, you know, similarly to Monique, we've had to really adapt what we're doing. And so have the schools, but actually there's been such a willingness to um, embrace the work that we're doing. So we're, we're, we're taking a piece about an astronaut who, um, who well, she, she, she loses her way on her way down to Earth. She's, she's gone for a runner away from the International Space Station and she finds herself in the playground of, well, a Devon primary school. Um, and that piece is, is visiting individual classes and we've had to think in all sorts of ways about, um, about how to reach children in the current circumstances. But I've found it reassuring that that work has been welcomed and I hope it's an indication of something wider and that things might be shifting. Mm -hmm. So there's some hope and some challenge in there, both mm. hand in hand. <laughs> um, that segued really beautifully to, I think, talking a little bit about uh, the impact of the pandemic on your work over the last nine months. Or I'd just be really curious to hear what your reality is looking like right now for each of you. I, we're in an astonishing set of circumstances. And what I'm hearing from Mickey and Monique is that some of the school's work is still able to happen. But I'm sure, you know, you're busy people and you have a lot on with your companies and with your work. So if you'd be willing to give us a little summary about what is reality right now in November 2020 feeling like and looking like, how has, how has the last nine months been, what sort of adaptations have you felt like you've had to make? Would anyone like to speak to that a little bit? Well, it's, a, it's about booking shows and unbooking shows and planning them again and unbooking them again. And uh, uh, well, what I often say is doing three times the amount of work for one third of the outcome. And that's... Um, uh, also a challenge, you know, also a challenge to, keep, to get your, keep your staff kind of happy and motivated to get through this time and, and book it again. So, uh, well, that's, and, but I think that's in a way what um, uh, not, it's not exclusively for the arts. You know, that's what lots of people, we all have that. We share that in this period. So, so there's no point of taking that personally and uh, we just need to deal with that. Um, um, we do take time now for, um, obviously, I think like lots of people, for investing online. And we're very happy that um, our city and province of Utrecht have uh, created a new fund. It's called the Culture in Innovation Fund, especially if you want to invest in a kind of an online new tool or something or in to do something. There. And um, uh, we won a pitch and now the news is that since last fri Friday we know that we really get money to do, uh, to build a new uh, uh, kind of an interactive video um, and where we want, um, want to build something that schools can log in and we can just make a construct that all kind of creative videos and interactive videos, well, it's, it's kind of a big project. It will take months to make, but it's, it's great to do. And we are, as artistic, um, uh, the core, artistic core of the company is really, really looking forward to that. Also because um, if you know our work, we uh, combine um, kind of high tech and old school. Like high tech, like also video, live video on stage and old school creativity, like building small stuff. And um, that is actually the combination we would like to use to build really build an environment but then film through it and well. so it's things like that um right away when the uh, covid started i think in in, in spring we made uh, uh three videos for um the primary schools we were asked to do that by um 
an organization that, um, well, it's a bit like Henrik does, but then for the, prov the province of Utrecht, you know, it has contacts with all the schools and um, what do, do they need? And it, we were happy to hear that schools missed creativity and culture in their, in their space, in their curriculum. And that was good to hear. Mm -hmm. And we were right away made three, very quickly, three films or videos uh, for that, uh, which were very well received, which is good. And um, because it's a big worry at the moment, because um, in the last decade, the Netherlands has invested a lot, uh, top in a way schools could um, get money. Um, uh, really in contrast to what Nikki just uh, tells us about uh, your situation, the schools in the Netherlands can all apply for money. They get it if they make a plan for culture in their school. And that's not, a, you know, it's not very hard to do that. So it's a kind of a low threshold. You need to make a plan and then you get the money, then you can just buy stuff culturally, arts, whatever you want to do as a school. And um, so our worry was that um, it, with this pandemic, we would lose everything that was being built up in the last decade. Also because kids miss um, time in their curriculum, you know, for math, for language, for this kind of, and we were working so hard with, uh, you know, for the whole field of children's theater, but wide, wider even creativity for children, um, to get creativity and arts more into the heart, really in the heart of schools. And I think that's where it should be, and we hope it will stay there. So, every, in a way, everything we do now in this pandemic is also a bit focused on how do we keep connected and what can we do to ensure that creativity will keep its dignified place at the center, you know, in, in the heart of, of the education of kids. Because mm -hmm. that's what we, we need, creative empowerment. And also of teachers, you know, not, it's not just the kids, it's also their teachers. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We've been having lots of conversations, I think, about support for our teachers here in the UK, who I think have been working very hard through the pandemic and really haven't had a break, it feels. So I think having that conversation across both the children and the teachers feels really important. Yeah. Henrik, would you like to come in on this at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I very much agree with Monique about the idea of keeping the creativity in, in the heart of the school. And that's been basically the task that we have, uh, we have had the last nine months to ensure that. I'll say in Denmark, we have a system which is quite sustainable in the sense that there's a system for bringing in the art. And of course, it's been pressed by the, by, by the current situation. And in the springtime, the schools were closed for a while and even the theaters were closed for a while as well but they opened already in again in in june and they have been open ever since and they are still open both the, the schools and and the, the theaters so what we have been working on is to uh, ensure that that uh, that of course all the companies still had a chance to go into the school we had the same concerns that you were talking about monique that 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 they were very pressed in this school system because of the period in the spring with the with the lockdown so we were very i mean they, they're very pressed in curriculum and in activities and, and everything and we can, of course we can feel that and the companies can feel that luckily they get subsidies from the government but still they have this huge challenge that they are all the shows that they want to that they were cancelled in the spring that they want to put into the schools now they are actually sort of of uh, of uh, getting into the schools instead of the new shows that they were supposed to produce so mm -hmm. everything will be pushed ahead for a couple of years in that sense and and since we had to cancel the april festival this year and even though we had and, and even also we had to cancel the uh, festival in september that was it was cancelled like 48 hours before it was, it was supposed to start so it was really hard for us because that was the, were the two chances for the companies to present new work the kind of new work that they had an opportunity to produce because it's also been difficult because the the, the possibilities of being together as a company and rehearsal and everything has really been threatened in 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 a long period they can do it now and we had a lot of opening in september and october but they they were actually actually pretty 
inactive in, in the whole spring in the work. So they are kind of working a little bit behind everything right now. What we see now is that actually the schools, what we feared in the spring is not, has not become a reality because what we, what we see now is that the schools are actually opening their doors for companies and they are also organizing tours into the theater. And I think that, I mean, I mean we see that in most of the country, a, f a few, a few municipalities accepted, but in most of the countries, we see actually that they are back in the system of bringing in the companies or going to the theater again. And what our task has been right now is because the, 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 the guidelines and the restrictions in the different municipalities have been so different. We have some national guidelines and national restrictions, but even they, they are interpreted in different ways in each municipality, which means that we actually, and every company has to be in contact with every single school or every municipality just to kind of negotiate how to uh, to interpret the the guidelines and and how to organize it so it takes a lot of time just to bring in one single show to the school it will go there and they will see it but 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 they are they are doing it under so different uh, circumstances in each place that it can be challenging and very stressing for the companies actually to do it because they in one place they are allowed to bring in two classes and they can do uh, basically what they normally do in another school they can only bring in once one class at a time they maybe have to perform two times for the same salary just to fulfill the goal of, of the number of spectators and and things like that which means that everything will be very complicated we have made some general guidelines that we are handing out. Uh, it's both to the companies and to the schools guidelines telling about how many uh, students are allowed to be in a room of this size, how, how much distance do you need between each, how do you get them in, how do you get them out, what do you do before, what do you do after, uh, uh, how do you put a two meter distance to the stage and stuff like that. Just to to ensure the schools or, or, or make them more safe about the, the whole event, that they actually feel that, that what they are, are doing, inviting a show is okay and not uh, dangerous because they of course have to, to, uh, to stand up to the parents and tell that they are not doing anything irresponsible mm -hmm. when they're bringing in artists into the school. So that's a lot of the work that goes just with all these kind of practical circumstances. But I can say that what we see now is that actually there are more shows uh, in the schools and there are sold more tickets in the theaters now than there normally are. So well, actually, actually what we see is that things are pressed very much together, but the activity is there. Mm -hmm. And we can see most of the, the, the theaters, uh, the local or regional theaters, they have sold out everything. Of course, there is that fact that they have a limited, limited number of tickets. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one thing. But still, when you look at it, you see that everything is sold out. So, so, so the, the need or the desire for experiencing art, we really feel that now. All that that we feared in the in in spring actually didn't come through now. Although we are in a worse situation in many ways now, and uh, and heading a, a very tough period now, mm -hmm. uh, we can see that we can keep the activity the activities moving actually, and and that the appetite is still lively. It's definitely it? still there. Definitely. Well, that's, that's a hopeful thing to hear. That uh, Henrik's grass is really greener than mine, I can say. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come to that well, conclusion. I, I, I'm not saying, Monique, that it's not a tough time because it is, and I know that the companies especially, I mean, I'm not talking for a company. If I was yes. sitting in the chair of a company, I mm -hmm. will really uh, feel the, the, the um, desperation, I'm pretty sure. But when you l go into the helicopter and look at it, it looks a little greener because you can actually see that things are happening. But I know it's pretty much frustrating to be a company trying to maneuver through uh, all this and actually also 
and that's a part of they are of course also losing money on it in some some way because they lost something in the spring that they don't know if they can get in later yeah in spite of the extra subsidies that they get from the government but even if i would get into a helicopter i would see see it is closed ah. or, or as, uh, no for the second time around there i think today uh, this weekend at least we're, they're opening again and we're performing again uh, but um, the national rule is that you can have um, up to the utmost 30 so three zero audience members uh, even if you have a very big auditorium oh. um, and there are also theaters who say well for that amount we can own not even have our technicians working. Um, so why invite a group to come and play here on this stage? Um, uh, luckily, there are theaters who do that, but that's the reality of everybody here. And um, there, in the, we heard from um, uh, the organization that does all the shows in our province that they get word from a lot of schools that they don't want to do anything before uh, spring holiday. You know, that they want to keep closed. So um, activities with workshops on schools are still continuing for us. Mm -hmm. And this residency, you know, that I talked about, this residency for kindergarten kids, that still works. But I think if I would get into, in, into uh, Henrik's helicopter and fly over the Netherlands, that it would be a lot less greener. Wow. Yeah. Well, I, I think the, and I'd say that in, in, certainly in England, you'd see a pretty arid landscape as well. Um, and it's, you know, our theatres are closed currently and have been, they, they opened briefly, but, but they're closed until the beginning of December at least. Um, and children weren't in schools predominantly um, from March until July and then there was a summer holiday, so they, they returned in September. So a long, long time out of education, a long time, well not out of education, but being homeschooled. Um, so it's life has been hard it's been hard for children whose world has sort of closed in like hard for parents um none of this will feel unfamiliar to other places but one of the things that we asked ourselves right at the beginning of the lockdown when we were really reeling you know and couldn't suddenly found ourselves not even being able to be together and cancelling performances was what was our bottom line what did we really want to be doing and we talked about the audiences we still wanted to keep in contact with and support through a time of real isolation and fear um, and sort of um, radical change as well. Um, and those were our real local community with whom we've been doing a lot of work and the community of teachers and children in primary schools, that's five to 11 year olds uh, in, in Devon in the Southwest of England. And, um, for a long period of time, we, we didn't feel able to perform, um, but we created educational activities. We looked at, um, and, and those were delivered online. We um, created a, a series of postcards for our local community. Um, we looked at ways of reaching people that, that weren't readily, um, who didn't find um, uh, digital communication easy or, or for whom it wasn't readily available. Um, and so we worked um, with food banks, we created, um, we wrote a book uh, with our writer and our, our designer illustrated it beautifully um, about the current times. And, uh, and we put together a sort of little creative pack that went out to, um, uh, to many, many children in, in the Southwest um, via, via food banks. So those children who were going, who were going hungry basically. Um, and then one of the things that we promised ourselves was that we would make a new piece of work for primary schools for the autumn, for primary school children, even if they weren't in their schools, we would do it, we would make a new piece. And it seemed to me that we had to think about not only um, the ways in which we made that work or toured that work, because everything was going to change, you know, every structure changed. You couldn't go to a group of children, you couldn't rehearse it in the same way, you couldn't all get into a van. Um, so that on one hand, uh, and then on the other hand, it seemed to me that the stories we were telling 
needed to change you know people were not in the same place so we, we were all ready to tour a particular show that autumn and it didn't feel to me like the right thing to be doing and in any case it would have been impossible um, we're, we're, we're a company who work really thoroughly and quite slowly, actually. I, I, I'm very slow. So I, I approach things terribly slowly. Um, and actually, we really had to shift that. I, I just knew, I knew from the beginning that we were going to have to be very, very quick on our feet. We were going to have, we knew that we had to respond fast to the situation, but it changed, it's changing all the time. Um, I also listened to a really inspiring talk. It was via Imaginate, actually. Thank you, Imaginate. And it was Ellie Griffiths at Oily Cart who talked about the notion of making a show that was uncancellable. And that seemed to me a really marvellous notion. And so, I, so we began to think about how we would do something in the autumn that would be uncancellable. Mm. And I, am, I can't tell you how proud I am that that thing is happening. It's actually happening. It almost seems like a dream, particularly at the moment when we're in another lockdown. And so, and so um, we began to think about stories that reflected our, our current and children's current situation. Um, we were inspired by um, the space travel that had gone on through lockdown. We were inspired by the sense of otherness that space gives at a time of such constraint. Um, it was interesting to think about a space person's costume, actually, really simply. But what a great way of walking around a school if you've got a spaceman's helmet on. Um, and, and also there's a sense of real delight and wonder when, a, when, a, when an astronaut suddenly appears, appears in your school, in your classroom. And I think we all know as artists that there are certain elements of structure and restraint that actually bring the best out in us. You know, that there are, there are ways of thinking, okay, I'm making a show, I need one person, you know, clearly it has to be one, it really had to be one at the moment. Nothing of theirs can touch the floor. They can't sit on a chair in the school, you know. Um, we have to produce it without being able to get close to each other. They have to be able to tell the story from three metres away from any children. Um, they can't get changed in a school. All of those things can actually add up to something that is, that changes things, that looks at the world a little differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the other thing that it squeezed us to do is look at other forms. I, I was really clear that I didn't want to be doing a lesser form of what we do because you know I don't want to make a bad film I don't want to do that and we don't have the same sorts of technical skills that Monique does in the company so I wanted to be using the real talents of the company to their best in different circumstances um, and it became clear looking at the beautiful illustrations that our designer was doing when we were creating educational resources um, and thinking about the way in which we work very closely with a composer Tom Johnson who who, who, who um, knits his, his music very, very precisely and intricately with the work that we do, that his work really suits, um, it would really suit um, underscoring animation. So that's what we've done. The children see an animation, and we'll, uh, perhaps I can put a little link to that out to people so they can see the animation. The children watch a short animation that tells the astronaut's story up to the point at which they're going to meet her. Um, before they do. Um, and that's been, it's just been a joy. It's been a joy working differently. It's been a joy um, thinking, how do you use the architecture of a school differently? Isn't it interesting if they meet Janet through their classroom window at first, not in their school hall? So there have been lots of very, very splendid things about it against a background of some horror, really. Yeah. As you're talking, we're, we're starting to get peppered with some really excellent questions. So I would quite like to turn this over to um, our attendees questions, which are starting to come at us. If you sat out there listening and this is prompting questions for you, please do feel free to pop them in the Q&A. Um, I feel like I could just sit here and nod and listen the whole time, but I want to make sure we get a chance to get around. So um, we've had a question posed um, from Grant Gore, who's a playwright here in the UK. And he's, he's curious about new writing for all three of you. Um, so he, he's asking, what do you do to develop new writing for young audiences? Do you have any schemes or initiatives? Um, because he's very aware of the lack of strong representation for teenagers. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything they'd like to say about new writing in their practice in response to that. Well, well pro probably I'm not, <laughs> I'm not the best person to talk about this, but um, 
because I'm very much interested in interdisciplinary work. Yeah. And that means that it's not text, text driven. Mm -hmm. It does have text, but it's not text driven. And uh, so if you would now afterwards, you know, if you finish it, you write the whole text down. It doesn't seem to be a play. But it makes perfect sense if you see it. Yes. <laughs> and, um, um, and the only thing that you can do that is um, when all the disciplines start together at the same time. Eh? Like, um, for instance, the performance Fall in Dreams that we made, that we also perform for teenagers. It works very well for them. Um, and you can see it in the Netherlands. Well, it's in Dutch, but you can see it online in the Netherlands. There's something, um, it's like theater flicks. So it's not Netflix, but theater flicks. And you can see for free lots of theater shows you know, now online in the Netherlands. Well, mm -hmm. that's just, and um, uh, we made it just by uh, having a composer and video man and, and me just think about the word falling. And um, there are so many things you can have, you know, like falling in love. Um, um, well, I, I can't do it that quickly in English, but in, in, in Dutch you have also with fallen. Fallen is our verb. You have a lot of expressions with fallen. Because it has something to do with, you know, surrendering or failing. Um, and um, we just started working from there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we first sort of thought it would be a very visual show, and then in the end we thought, oh shit, she, we need we need words. And then <laughs> in the middle of the night I started writing. You know, it was just a lot of improvisations, and I started writing. And in the end, you have a show with kind of poetic text, but we didn't start off with that. So actually, I have a very bad answer. You know, um, um, text is something f in our company that is um, it, we love we love text but we don't necessarily think that it needs to be the fundament mm. of show. Mm. So we, love poetry, we use poetry, we love, we use text, but um, yeah. It's an honest answer, which I think is always the right answer. <laughs> yeah. um, I can say in, in, in Denmark, I, yeah, I can say, I mean, uh, of course, we are, there's a huge variety of how you produce shows in Denmark. There are Monique's examples are a lot of them, and of course there are companies that are producing shows based on on text and based on the plays, uh, written uh, contemporary plays or older plays. We see that a lot. But I can say what we do uh, in Denmark is that we have, I mean, we we do a couple of things. We uh, we have what we call a greenhouse, which is a kind of of two-year part-time education for people who want to write for children. So they attend a program where they, where, where they work with writing and, uh, and each year we present uh, the new work uh, in, in, uh, in different kinds of, of uh, events. So, and they are, of, of course, after that free to the market uh, to choose from. So that's one way that we try to, to, uh, to do something about having contemporary plays written by playwrights in Denmark. And those who attend the Greenhouse program is mostly people who are working in the field, but we also see playwrights coming from, from maybe the field of adult theater and, and trying to convert their writing into children, which is good as well. And then we have, uh, every year we have, uh, we have an award for best uh, children play. It's handed out every year in September. So, so in that sense, we get a, some spotlight on the nominees and uh, of course of, uh, of uh, the winner of that award. So in that sense, we just put out in the open that people are working to try to create new works in Denmark. And one of these, actually the piece that we won last year in 2019, we had it translated into German because the idea was it didn't happen because of the situation but the idea was what was that it was going to have a reading in a german festival uh, during 2020 but i hope we can do that next year instead mm. that greenhouse program sounds amazing what, what a fantastic initiative nikki do you know do we have anything we anything similar in the uk i'm trying to think about schemes of support I'm not, sure for new we, writing. I'm not sure whether we do actually it'd be interesting people could perhaps put that in the chat if they know let us know if they know of things that are, I'd be very interested to know. Um, but really Alibi, Alibi have such a relationship with the writing and um, connection with the writer embedded in the company. I don't know if you want to speak at all about that. Yes, maybe. I mean it's a really interesting notion 
So we do, we have an associate writer, Dan Jameson, and this is a really long standing partnership that has gone, you know, it's decades old. Um, but having said that, I'd say our probably our, our, our commitment is actually to story. Um, and it's not dissimilar to Monique in many ways in that I'd say for us, theatre making is a very highly collaborative process. So we have an associate writer, we also have an associate composer and we have an associate designer and the, that at its real best, um, th those, there's, there's, um, those things marry, you know, and they're, they're very tightly intertwined. Um, so, um, some t then, and different, different elements will probably um, uh, take the lead at different points. So it's not necessarily that we'd all start together, but that there's, but it's not, um, we don't take for granted uh, which element might come first, mm. you know, that, that, that one's open to that. Um, and so I'd say that, that text and the shaping and writing, uh, so writing can mean all sorts of things, can't it? But the, the shaping of a narrative is really really key to us um but but that 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 but, but that dan jameson our writer is is one of a very tight-knit team mm -hmm. um and probably if you look at children's theater in this country i think i can see why why the questioner is is asking about that i, I think there is there isn't a vast amount of writer led work mm -hmm. um and and i wonder whether that is partly to do with the sort of the visual nature of and, and oral nature of children's work, you know, um, that, that it's such a, a, a multi-sensory experience and that those things matter. Um, so uh, yes, it's probably something to interrogate further. Yeah, it does prompt me to think a bit about the New Connections programme, um, which I think does, does a bit of that. But yeah, certainly a, certainly a long way to go, I think, in terms of supporting that. Um, we've, we've had a question posed, um, from Noel Jordan from the Imaginate Festival. And I think Noel might want to come on and ask his question himself. So should we have a go at having a live question? Noel, are you able to join us to ask your question live? It's going to be a good tech test for us right now. Ah, oh, it works. Um, Noel, go for it. Go ahead and pose your question to the panelists. Excellent. Hello, everyone. So lovely to hear your different um, experiences of the last eight months. And um, I really love the energy of today. It's, it's kind of relaxed and informed and just, it, we're all, I'm just so aware our situations are so vastly different. Here, theatres are closed and we have no sense of when they might be open, but in England, you've had a bit of open and shut. But my question, um, I'm just wondering for the panellists, do you think that this time has allowed you to kind of form deeper links with your own immediate communities that you live and exist and um, kind of thrive within? And if so, what are the, some of the benefits that um, may have uh, come out of those encounters or experiences? That's to generally anyone on the panel. A great question, Noor, thank you. Is there anyone who'd like to speak to that first? Well, there's one benefit that comes to mind, pops to mind uh, right away, is um, that we suddenly are more flexible. So there is more short, in short term, kind of, uh, in short notice, kind of booking or uh, contact is more quickly. And um, for instance, we had a show premiered in October and often then the intermediate organization wants six weeks ahead all the arts education uh, materials. Well, you can make a show in that time <laughs> almost, you know? So um, uh, it is like, well, we don't send it with doves anymore, you know, we're, we're, everybody's online the whole day. So suddenly we can just um, work much quicker together with organizations that used to be very slow. And also we as an organization are, you know, so, so it means that we can deliver a more, yeah, specific, more custom made and quicker. Mm. And there's a good side to that in a way. There's an immediacy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Hi, hi, Noel. It's good to hear your voice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we have we have had an actually a very interesting experience that I think we'll bring with us uh, in the future because we, I mean, we are not normally working in a local community as we are have a, a national task and we are mostly mostly working in most of the country, but we are uh, we are organizing a festival in a 
the specific municipality every year, which give us a very close connection to the municipalities that we are working with when we are organizing the festival. And as we had to cancel the festival in Holbeck, the municipality of Holbeck this year, uh, the, the municipality ask us if it was possible actually to take up the 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 hostmanship the year after so they are will be the hosts uh, in 2021 as well which is actually amazing because they are paying for the festivals so basically they are paying the festival twice to do that which is a great cadeau to the politicians of Holbeck. That's one thing. But the thing is that working with the municipality two times and under these uh, conditions that we are working in now, where we actually see the necessity of getting closer to, the, uh, to our audience and our, to our partners to make things happen, actually improves all, the, all the, the tools and the methods and the way that we approach a municipality. So that experience of getting closer and then closer dialogue with our audience and with our organizers, with the, with the local communities within uh, the municipality, actually teach us, us the necessity to be in a one-to-one -one conversation with a lot of those we are working with that we normally not are. And it brings a lot of, of, of ideas and creativity back to us in the way that we produce uh, the festival. And that is something I think that we will take with us in, in uh, the time to come when we are organizing the festival in new municipalities. That approach that we have learned here we can take directly and and uh, put into our our, uh, our structure in the future. Mm, a nice learning to take forward. Nikki, you were going to say something as well. Well, uh, in some ways we were sort of lucky in that when lockdown happened, we were part way through a project that was um, based on our immediate locality. So um, we're, we're in Exeter in the southwest of England, um, but we're also in a very particular part of Exeter, we're in St Thomas, which is on the wrong side of the river you know it's the it's the it's the area of the city that has a history of flooding for example and uh, and so it's it's um it, it's seen it's seen as the sort of poor cousin and uh and yet there's a real pride in the area so we've been doing a lot of work and we've been talking to an awful lot of people we had um we held a large exhibition prior to lockdown based on the area and we'd collected around 60 or 70 stories you know oral histories so we had quite we had started to build relationships and we um we're based in an old church hall which has a lot of local history you know connected to it so when we went into lockdown we began sending out this little series of postcards every week actually it's really interesting you know when could a theater company ever contact its audience weekly without driving them up the wall and actually <laughs> we were you know um, in a very small area, about 150 people were opening them every week, um, and and we were getting and and this was a you know a, a a Mailchimp mail out, and we were getting answers to them. Again, you don't get that usually. People just saying thank you, and um, so we were doing that. But then we also um, decided that as soon as we were allowed out, we would do something physical in whichever way we could. We, we had planned a, lar a large scale show and we weren't going to be able to do that. But we decided that we would try and reach people in whatever way we could. And so we, we planned a series of walks, of storytelling walks around the area. So telling the stories of the area, in the area. And at that point, we were allowed to take six people out with us. It was a fiendishly complicated booking system because because of working around, you know, COVID bubbles and things. Um, so we we did that and we also arranged a series of um performances for streets um because a, a lot of street communities had had emerged during lockdown there were um, a lot of whatsapp groups for example connected to individual streets in the area had emerged and so it felt important and interesting to be working with those newly built communities um so we did, we did a series of performances based on stories that people had told us, some of which were working their way slowly down the street as people watched from their front doors. Um, and uh, they were a complete joy, actually, and, and seemed very unlike anything I'd ever seen before, because usually those things are, are spectacle, but by its very nature, because we couldn't, even along the street, you couldn't gather anywhere except for on your front doorstep. 
it had to be a sort of little rolling performance that made its way down some rather long roads actually so um for us it has been it has felt like those local partnerships have become stronger through this time and and as monique says again it's been clear that there's a real hunger there's a real there's a real need um for for, for creativity mm -hmm. No, I don't know if you want to come back on any of those responses. Have you got anything you'd like to say? Oh, I just, look, I, I, that's exactly been our experience here in Edinburgh, and I just wondered if it resonated with other communities. And I, I really do think these are the stories we, we need to tell about the, the benefits of the arts for young people and communities. And um, for us, it's been the ability to not only employ lots of local artists, but the um, incredible inventive ways they're coming up with continuing school residencies and they're not allowed in the front door. Like the, the online ability, I know that we're all zoomed out. However, it's allowed us access into windows we had never thought possible. So thank you so much. Thank you, that's a great question. Yeah, windows like this. <laughs> it strikes me that this conversation is, is made possible. Um, we've had another question posed by Hannah, Hannah Simons. I'm not sure if I'm saying her name right. And she's a teacher who sat in a busy school environment at the moment. So I'm going to read it out for her, but I'm really pleased she's with us today. Um, she asks, do you think that this pandemic will change the way in which we experience theatre? Will we move away from big scale productions in big venues and move into smaller scale productions? A higher focus on going into schools, maybe? Um, or do you think people will still want that large scale experience? And then final bit, could this maybe be a time to exploit the fact that everyone or everything may have to be performed in a smaller community scale? That feels like a nice pickup on some of those previous conversations. So how does this look going forward, guys? What do you think? Hmm. Uh, can, I, can I say a little bit uh, about that? Uh, because here in Denmark, we, we don't see that many big scale uh, pr uh, productions anyway mm. uh, for children uh, or that's n that's not the ordinary way of experience theater because we have had this this idea of of theater theater in eye level what we, is what we call it theater in eye level meaning that you when you are producing theater for, you have to take a lot of different things in consideration when you are doing the production and one of the things that you have to to consider is the number of spectators in each show that it has to relate re very much directly to to the both the the age of the children and uh, and what they can uh, what's the word what they can actually relate to as an audience so so if it means around the world that we are limiting the situation where a lot of children are going into a big scale show sitting and can't see anything but the neck of the one sitting in front of you and and uh, transforming that into s smaller uh, uh, shows that actually gives the children the opportunity to experience what art can do to them then i can only welcome it because that's what we have an experience with in denmark anyway mm. Other thoughts? Well, in the uh, in the Netherlands, we do have uh, kind of large, well, large scale. I think 600, 600 kids or six hundred people in the audience. We don't have that kind of shows often for schools. Mm -hmm. It's more for families, and often then the half of the audience members would be adults or even more than that. You know, two thirds of them. So it's more like Christmas shows or whatever. Um, for and um, there is something to that, that scale that I really like, especially if all generations are there, you know, that, that you're all together in, in something really um, in, kind of impressive because it's so big to say it simply, you know, to, um, and um, uh, it, which is, can be a nice feeling. I agree with, with theater on eye level, you know, and, and um, um, I, I'm not sure whether this pandemic would lead to more small scale um, things. It, it does lead now to more local, mm. um, local things, but in a way it's, it's, it's funny, I think, because in a way it's more local, you focus more local because you can't travel around. And the other hand, online, you see more now, of like we have this talk, this kind of international outreach. And like I'm also, we were also making creative videos for China at the moment. You know, so, 
that's also interesting how how this global um, online works with lo with local work together. Mm. Um, I don't think necessarily lar large scale will will disappear or, or will lessen for this. Maybe we'll sit with uh, mouth masks yeah. and just go to a show. I'm not sure. But I do, I do know that we as a company do a little, and especially I think I also hear it from colleague companies in the Netherlands, they do now more in, um, um, focus more on work that you can perform in schools or in school yards so that kids sit before the windows, you know, and you're in school yards. So that's what colleagues also do. And um, for instance, we have a, a show, um, it's called Weird 1.5, 1.5 being the distance, you know, uh, we at 1.5 um, and we're also going to perform that for an, a different age group in the schools. Normally we would, we would also only do that for group one and two, we're also not going to do that for three and four. That's a result of the, of the pandemic, so it changes a bit, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Nikki, do you want to add? It's so hard to know, isn't it, from right in the thick of it. I mean, my sense is that it can't help but change things to some extent. And if only it's if only um, in that our eyes will have been opened a little wider, you know, that that that, the, that different possibilities have been opened up to us all. Um, so I, I think we will have we will have learned that things can be di done differently, and, uh, and and we will have been given a shift of perspective. You know, I think um, I, I personally would be I'd be very sorry to be losing performances that happen in in theatres. I really would be if I think about some of Monique's work or the work that I love most. There's something about the particularity and beauty that can be um, that, that can be sort of created mm. on the theatre light, you know, and, and with an audience in those circumstances that I would, uh, well, it would make me ache if that went. But, um, and I don't think it will, I don't think it will, but my sense is that, um, that we there might be things that get thrown out because we realize that they aren't important and and mm -hmm. i think that there might be a real renewed focus on on a real integrity in terms of audience relationships and i think that that might be connected to the work in communities mm -hmm. and in and the way in which we've been forced to rethink things mm. that integrity in relationship is a nice full circle to some of Enrique's first comments about the quality of the experience as well um, we have another question that's been uh, posed by Vicky Ireland, but I'm hopeful that she might be able to ask it live. Um, so we're going to have a go. There she is, slick as can be. Vicky, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much. Hello. Um, I'm slightly going around in a circle. Uh, it, it, it's because we have this overarching problem that, that certainly in England, our government have no particular strategy about children being allowed to access the arts. Yeah. Whereas in quite a lot of other countries, there are certain structures. And um, Henrik, I just wondered, do you still have the, um, the Danish culture crew and the Danish suitcase? Yes, yes. Thank you, Vicky, for asking that question. Uh, I was hoping to get a chance to talk a little bit about that because it's, it's a very important thing for us, actually. Because what we are working with these years are actually to give the children or to give our audience a voice or a clearer voice in the whole, not only in the shows, but also in, in the whole, in the whole uh, activity around the shows. Uh, I mean, we have had a system for so many years. I mean, children, they don't normally don't decide themselves if they are going to the theater or not, or what they are going to see if they go to the theater. And we are very curious about what uh, children actually would say if you ask themselves what to do, if they wanted to go to the theater or not, or what they want to see when they go to the theater. So we have been invest investigating that for some years, and we are actually doing a PhD about it, which is coming out here next year about the, the voice of our audience and we have had a program for some years and that 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 the, the that's a program that Vicky is talking about we call it the cultural crew which is it's actually a, a, a it's it's a project that's about 
uh, not only about democracy and giving the the children a voice, but also making them active in the in the in this in the event of presenting art. So a cultural crew is a group of students in a school. They are elected among themselves or by teachers and or in many different ways. But their task is to ensure that the school have a cultural policy that they present uh, art in different kinds for 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 their. Uh, co-students and uh, that these things uh, when they take place that they take place in a frame that is uh, useful for both artists and for children so and we have uh, cultural crews in more than 100 schools in Denmark and they have actually uh, more or less in many municipalities become uh, the new uh, presenters or promoters because they are the ones who are going to the April festival and, and select uh, the shows for the peers. So, so that's basically what they do. They engage in art and we educate them. There's an educational program that we uh, take care of to edu educate them to become uh, to become event makers and we teach them how to uh, curate for peers uh, we teach them how to organize uh, events and shows and stuff like that and uh, uh, doing that we are pretty sure that we not we are not only making a, a new uh, cultural elite for the future but we are also actually listening to the to the voice of the of the the children of today by doing that so we are still running that uh, program and it's increasing every year. We are trying to convince more and more schools and municipalities that it's a good idea to have this, this system because it also creates an, uh, a, a democratic uh, conversation about art in the school run by the, the students themselves. Mm -hmm. We also engage in a, in, a, in a teen program in Europe where we have worked in the same way with the teenagers from our, around Europe, where we are organizing, we call them kitchen table uh, conversations with teenagers, where teenagers uh, meet teenagers and they, they make the rules and run the conversation. So the, the topics that they are talking about is basically uh, what is uh, on their mind. So we cannot do anything but just sit back listen and learn uh, when they are talking so so we are, we are very much into that these years mm. vicky was also talking about the the suitcase of the cultural package program that we are running which is a program that ensures that uh, children not only meet the theater every year but they meet the theater dance and music and it's also organized in in a system where uh, where we help the school and the students to ensure that every child in that school will meet that at least one time a year. One concert, one dance uh, show or a dance workshop or whatever or and, and a theater show. And these programs are, of course, helping us to to fulfilling our vision of giving every child uh, arts in their lives, but it's actually also a program for the future mm -hmm. to ensure that that uh, the demand of having art is not coming only from us, but also coming from the children. Mm -hmm. So, and um, a lot of people are wondering whether if the children are to decide, because that's one thing when you do this, you really have to accept the fact that the children are decision makers and you have to make uh, to respect the decisions that they are doing, which is for some teachers especially uh, sometimes very hard to do so so and we we're talking about distinguishing between this model and you know the spinach model where we are telling the children that they have to have art and theater because it's healthy for them and then the 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 program where they are actually demanding themselves to have the art uh, to be presented to art in their lives so that's what we are aiming for in this program mm -hmm. I love the phrase, the spinach model. That, I'm shutting that one down right now. Yeah, the, 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 the demand and the hunger is there. Vicky, I don't know if you want to come back in response to any of that. What an inspiring list of things that they've got going on. Yeah, um, I, I first heard about this in Israel, actually. There's something that's been running there for years called the Cultural Basket. And then um, in Germany, there's a rucksack. In Denmark, there's a suitcase. All over Europe, there's this fabulous program and at Action for Children's Arts we've been uh, done a feasibility study on something we call the Arts Backpack UK 
which we're talking to Arts Council about. Um, and we've got one pilot happening, we want more, but we can't raise funds. To, f to get people interested in the UK with children and young people is somehow so difficult. It's like, you know, they should be the most important thing in the world and they're not. But we're, we're headbanging it <laughs> and we're talking to the Arts Council on Monday yet again. So if anybody's interested, please. Um, it's a wonderful idea these countries have generated, something that we should, we should really want to join in and pick up and run with. And I think if Henrik could help us in any way or any of the other countries, we, our ears are open. And um, so let's all join together and maybe make it happen here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. Pop, please pop some information in the chat about that. Um, and we'll circulate things after today's conversation as well to try to spread the word, because I think so much of this stuff's about awareness and communication, isn't it, really? Um, we've had another question posed. Um, oh, gosh, we've had loads of questions posed. We're not going to get to them all. I'm just going to say that now. There's some wonderful questions uh, being set up. Um, we've had a question posed um, from Eloise Mace, and I think she'd like to ask it herself as well about kind of entry into the industry. Um, Eloise, are you able to join us? Ah, oh, brilliant. Do you want to ask your question? Hello. Hey, you're on. Hi. Um, I'd just like to say it's been really interesting to hear all the ways that you've managed to like adapt to coronavirus. It's been really insightful. Um, but I just thought I'd like to ask about breaking into the industry rather than already being in it because obviously from the outside it looks extremely bleak and um yeah so i just wondered if you had any advice about breaking into the industry in this current climate does anyone have any words of hope <laughs> <laughs> oh i re i have so much sympathy um and <laughs> so I, I and i totally recognize that it's not easy at the moment Eloise um, and I think that probably goes for young people in well almost every industry currently it's difficult um, I think the thing to do is to um, keep talking talk talk to um, talk to companies get in touch with them ask what they are doing um, and there are things happening so for example um, there's a the kickstart program for which is being used by some some organizations to um to to create um arts internships um and certainly there's there's um, a move to be um for that to be happening um in exeter mm -hmm. um so that's a that's a government funded program uh and i think when i think back to um the sorts of opportunities that that have been made available by by alibi it's often just through those 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 conversations happening, um, but also keep your eye out, keep your eye out for any programs of activity like things things like the Kickstart program. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it, you know, it is just I know that it's hard. I know that it's hard, and I I am I I also know that that to some degree. Um, people are are making their own opportunities but where where that makes my heart sink it's is where um where, where the where there is no money happening but mm -hmm. there's there's also um an increasing push from the arts council to be funding people right at the start of their career so that they that just for the moment there's there's an emphasis on looking towards people who haven't previously had funding and haven't had a great deal of experience so there mm -hmm. is there is at least some acknowledgement um, of the the difficulties that people who are just coming into the industry are facing, mm -hmm. I, I hope that that gives some just some speckles <laughs> of um, of hope to you, Eloise. Thanks. Can I can I just give a little bit of of inspiration to you in, in the UK or elsewhere about how we're doing it in Denmark? Because this is a very important thing. It's a very important task for the industry itself to ensure that that this introduction of new people will happen all the time. So what we are doing in the festival every year, we are always welcoming new companies in the festival to participate in the festival. It's not a curated festival in Denmark, uh, April festival. You have to be improved. Uh, approved in the reimbursement system uh, so if you are that you can go and participate with your show in the festival so and we have um, approximately 15 20 new companies every year attending uh, like new attendees uh, and besides that we invite you know all the upcoming uh, companies shows to come and take part in the in the community of us so we pair them 
with uh, with other companies so they actually has like a mentor company that they can lean on to both in the festival so they will be introduced to the to the to the business and to the industry by uh, by other professionals and introduced to all the people there and uh, so and afterwards so they actually have a connection and somebody to ask which actually for most of the new companies m means that they have an easier way at least to have somebody to talk to and ask uh, whenever they get into any kind of uh, challenges in their upcoming. Mm. Lovely, Monique. That might also be a good idea. I, I don't know if I, from my, my point, can add something, but I, um, finding a mentor company, like Vicky says, staying in touch with companies and festivals. And I think what you always can do is. Um, uh, keep yourself try to keep yourself inspired there's now so much you can see from all over the world online um, so um, if you have time uh, that you can you know use for that then I would say dive into it and try to find um, um, try to enrich yourself yeah and and that kind of uh, immediacy with which we can access and see work is quite exciting right now isn't it so there's an opportunity there eloise i don't know if you want to come back oh no thank you so much that's been very helpful i might have to move to denmark to get a job <laughs> you're welcome eloise <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we've got another question, um, which I'd like to go to, uh, which might have to be our last question. I'm just very aware of the time, um, which is a question from Sarah Richardson. And I'm just going to go ahead and read it out be because of time. So Sarah is the director of Filament Projects, a small scale independent theatre company in Cheshire. Um, and her question, and it feels like a good one maybe to end on actually, is what role does or could theatre have in children's recovery? from this period of intense change and collective trauma? What are the possibilities? What are our responsibilities as theater makers? Oh yeah, that's a huge one. Yeah. Definitely is. Mm. Well, I'll just do a, a pensive yeah. silence as we can. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, uh, first of all, it, it's of course, I think it's very important to understand how important art are for children in their development and in the, in, the, in creating themselves because that's a part of the, of the answer to that question or a part of that question and the, what we are talking about you you were into that uh, Nikki as well in the way that you were working uh, we we talk about the idea of uh, of for with and by i don't know if you use that expression as well i mean uh, what we see right now and what we can see uh, th that every time that somebody visits a school with a show, it inspires to do something with the, the children afterwards. And we have developed some, you know, conversation guides to, to the teachers or to the, to the class or to the audience afterwards that makes actually, uh, uh, that, that, that makes a possibility to have a, a interesting conversation afterwards with the children. And all that kind of stuff, I think, is even more necessary in these times to use and to do and to have time to to dig into uh, when you are uh, dealing or when you are uh, experiencing art because these conversation is what normally in a lot of senses in our or a lot of situations in our lives cure us or give us an answer or raise new questions that brings us on and so on and i think it's very important for us to emphasize the necessity of of bringing these tools into the schools together with the art that we are, are bringing uh, so it's not only about the experience of the artistic work but it's also about what's before and what's after in every uh, every encounter with the art that you have uh, in the school or in the theater. So I think that's one way that we can work with this and that's one tool that we have that I think really can help uh, getting into and not only over but also into the situation that we've been to through the last uh, nine months. Mm. What, what comes to um, I, I, I agree with Henrik, but I, I think what comes to mind to me is uh, the wonderful 
uh, research that Wolf and Brown are doing in the United States for uh, the new victory and um, where they find that um, uh, groups of kids that they have for three years and from uh, schools that have 95% of the kids have school lunch. So that says something of the social um, uh, area they're in. And um, you see that what, and they get um, three shows a year, 15 workshops for three years. So the combination of active and receptive in a way. And um, you see that the, the biggest change with these kids, because they did it a blind, uh, uh, with a control group, they did this research. The biggest, biggest change that they see is that kids get more hope. And that's what you want now. And, um, and but these, the interesting thing, these shows and these workshops were not designed to bring hope. They were just programmed, it was the normal program that New Victory had. They were just picked out in their program. So I think you don't need to deliberately make kind of therapeutical story. It's, it's the art itself that finds the way to your soul and will heal, will help. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I agree with all of those things. Um, I think, um, you know, on a very immediate level, um, it's very clear, it's really clear when, when we're arriving in a primary school and when our actor is signing the visitor's book and we are the first person from outside who's been into the school since March, um, you get a sense of the way the, 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 the world in which children are operating. It's, it's, it's very constricted um, and, uh, and it doesn't take much to, to see that sense of hope just to, on the children's faces, you know, in a very immediate, on a very immediate level. When you when you watch the work happening, but but I think Monique's right that 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 it's good to look in more long term, um, and uh, yeah we've also been um, we've been lucky enough to have a um, a doctorate um, a PhD um, piece of research going on with our work where where the where the um, researcher Elaine Fall who'll be talking in one of these conversations was returning to the children over three years after having watched a, sh a show, um, uh, and children talk talk openly actually and with real clarity about their lives being changed you know it's 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 radical stuff um and and now it it, it feels completely clear that having um uh, the, the the imagination is is not it's not a luxury it isn't a luxury it's absolutely central to us coping with the sorts of um loss and transformation that we've had to deal with Imagination is not a luxury it feels like the most powerful sentence for us to end on today. <laughs> um, I, I thank you. This has been really hope giving and inspiring for me. Um, and I can tell by the conversation that's going on in the chat that um, I think it's been so for others as well. Um, if people haven't had a chance to have a look at what's happening in the chat do you scroll back up because there's some incredible signposting happening to some initiatives that certainly weren't on my radar at all um, but also i think some good conversations that would definitely pick up here in the uk about ways forward for us um, drawing inspiration from some of this amazing work that we're hearing about um, so do you make sure that you have a look but also we'll do our best to circulate the good stuff out of this via email after today's event um, yes, thank you all. Thanks for listening, those of you that have been listening. Thank you to our panelists for your wisdom and your hope and your honesty. It's just a real pleasure to have you with us. Um, and thank you to Theodore Alibi for making this happen. I do want to make sure that people are aware that there's another one of these next Thursday. We're going to do another chat next Thursday, the 26th of November, which is going to feature Elaine Fall, who's been doing PhD research, as Nikki was mentioning. It's going to feature Heidi Vaughan from Travelling Light um, and Erica van der Kirchhoff from Artemis Theatre. I'm really excited for that conversation next Thursday and another on the 3rd of December. So do join us and thank you for all your thank yous. I think we'll, we'll sign off there um, and wish you all a very happy afternoon full of inspiring thoughts about the way forward. Cheers, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I think we'll go videos off camera.